turn. All right. So today we're talking about the chain rule. The chain rule is going to drastically increase the number and type of functions that we can take the derivative of. Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the derivative is good for telling us what? The slope of the tangent line. Slope of the tangent line. Uh, and then we can find the slope of the tangent line. Our points are also good for telling us the instantaneous rate of change. How fast something is changing right at that given moment. Okay? So we kind of know that it's really helpful, but we're still sort of limited on what we can find the derivative, which type of functions we can find the derivative of. We can find the derivative of the six trig functions. What else can we take the derivative of? What can we take, what type of functions can we take the derivative of? Quadratic. Quadratics. Quadratics. Okay. So that's anything with like an x squared in front of it. But that's part of a, that's a subset of a, a quadratic group of a larger family Poly of polynomials, where you've got any multiplier times x to the n plus or minus any uh, variable, say c times x to the n minus one, you know, plus c times x to the n minus two, you know, you write those down. These are, those are polynomials where you have blah x to the blee, bloop x to the blum, blunder x to the bladder. See what I'm saying? Like anything where you've got that. So we can take derivatives of those. We can take the derivative in some way. So if you have this times this, we take the derivative of that. We can take the derivative of things where you have this over this. What else can we take the derivative of? This is about it, right? The product rule, quotient rule, all polynomials, obviously the power rule, and, and, and Polynomials are sort of like the result of the, the power rule and the constant multiple rule. Um, like I said, and the trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, okay? However, things get um, difficult if we want to take the square root, if our function is something like this. What is the sine of x squared, or sorry, the sine of x squared, take the derivative of that because all of a sudden we have a function, x squared, inside another function. So see, we can take the derivative of x squared and we can take the derivative of sine of x because we kind of looked and saw the pattern like that, but the sine of x squared is a different function, okay? And, and if, if, if we actually were to graph it, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like a nice, so that it's not it's not cosine, it's something different. Okay, so you just take my word for it on that one. Okay. Um, also, if we had g of x equals the square root of x cubed plus x, we know how to take the derivative of x cubed plus x, and we know how to take the derivative of the square root of x because that's just x to one half. But when we have the square root of x cubed plus x, we don't know, right? This is this is beyond us. This is a function inside another function. Do y'all see that? It's we could say like x cubed plus x is the inner function, and square root of x is the outer function. The thing, the operation going on the outside. So um, that's a problem, and that problem is solved by the chain rule, okay? So let's go ahead and figure out what the chain rule is. What we have here, oh, there are two reminders that I need to tell you. And maybe I'll put them here and then we can discuss the chain rule. So I'm gonna, in the middle of my, of our derivation over here, I'm gonna sort of wave my hand and say, everybody remember this? And you'd be like, oh yeah, okay, this, this is gonna be the, the thing that we're gonna remember. So the first off is the limit form of the derivative. So that is f prime of x equal to the limit delta x squared to zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x all of delta of x. As well as the alternate form of the derivative at a point, which is what we talked about yesterday, f prime evaluated at c is the limit as x approaches c of 
f of x minus f of c all over x minus c. So those are two things that we're going to... Real quick, how do you know when you get that? Just on your given given point? Well, normally, we are beyond those. Normally, if I say find the derivative, We'll just find, just you're going to apply the product rule or the chain yeah. rule or the power rule or any of those or or the the, those are just the like chain the long rule. Ways of doing it, yeah. Those were the long ways of doing yeah, and sort of involved in uh, what they did is they, they did this so many times that they began to notice the pattern and then they and then they said, Let's just let's do this symbolically, like we did. We symbolically did the product rule. Remember that? And got yeah. it to where you could just fill in. And got it where it was just a little a nice little trick there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so us, we, there's not a whole lot of situations that we're going to use these in the course of solving a problem that we use these now to help build uh, more shortcuts. Mm -hmm. um, little side note, there are some math teachers that think that love to tell students shortcuts and they tell them the shortcuts before the long cuts. Mm -hmm. That's like worst math practice ever, okay? <laughs> because you don't, you, you never appreciate the shortcut, and I would argue you don't even really understand it until you've done it the long way, at least once. You don't have plenty of problems of it, but at least do it one time so you can be like, yes, that is a very long, laborious process. I understood every step, and I would hate to do that again for the rest of my homework life. And so <laughs> you just are like, I'm gonna, and so get it once and then you can appreciate it. So we're gonna kind of do that right here, right now. So um, here we go. Our problem is we're going to have h of x equal to some function f of x, but then inside f of x is g of x. Just like we saw a second ago, um, a larger function like sine was a smaller function on the inside x squared, or the larger function square root was a smaller function here, x cubed. So I'm going to refer to this as you know, the outer and the inner. Does that make sense, Rigel? Mm -hmm. Like outer would be the sign, the inner would be x squared. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, f of x is the outer function, g of x is the inner function. And I'm going to find h prime evaluated at c because that's kind of the easier way for me to do this, for show you this derivation. So I'm going to find the derivative value at c, and the formula that I'm going to utilize is this alternate form of the derivative evaluated at a point. So let's see if we can do this together. So this is the limit as x approaches c, and then normally I would put f of x right there. Um, but because uh, my function is h and, and h is defined as f composed of g, I'm going to write f composed of g of x. Then we have minus the function evaluated at c, so that's going to be f composed of g of c all over x minus c. So that's applying that definition. Next step, for no apparent reason, I'm going to multiply this by g of x minus g of c over g of x minus g of c. that's going to give us h prime of c equals the limit as x approaches c. I think I might um, leave this numerator as is. f composed of g of x minus f composed of g of c.
over when the snow work. G of X minus G of C. Every, this guy stays the same, this guy stays the same. I just, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of switching these two things. So uh, remember, if you're, if you're mul when you're multiplying fractions, multiplying numerators, multiplying denominators, it doesn't really matter which order you multiply the denominators in. You could have x minus c times g of x minus g of c, or g of x minus g of c times x minus c. Sound good? So it's literally like kind of the same thing. So next up, I'm going to apply the limits to both sections. So h prime evaluated to give the limit as x approaches c of this part here, f composed of g of x minus f composed of g of c evaluated as g of x minus g of c. Minus, sorry, not minus, I'm sorry. The limit as x approaches c, g of x minus g of c all over x minus c. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, we are almost done. Let's look at this right here. The limit as x approaches c of g of x minus g of c over x minus c. What does this look like? Okay, it, it looks like this one right here. It, it looks like uh, it's the it's not quite, it's not the derivative of C, it is, it's the derivative of, I would say, G evaluated at C. Let me say that again, it's the derivative of G, so it's G prime evaluated at C. Because if you look there, it's almost, like, it's almost identical to this right here, except I have, you know, there there's F's, here there's G's. Okay, no big deal. In fact, this one, is almost the same exact thing. Look at this. F of law <laughs> minus F of, you know, F of G of X minus F of G of C minus G of X minus G of C. So I've got the same thing inside the F as I have right here, which I've got the same thing inside the F as I have right here. And I have F with something C and F with something C. Same thing over here, right? Okay, so what we need to see is, is that this right here is a derivative as well. It is f prime. At g of c. Yes, and then at g of c. g of c is kind of the, the one that's inside. So h prime evaluated at c equals the derivative of the outer function with the inner function just as is times the derivative of the inner function. Let me write that over here uh, without the, the c's, but instead with the x's. Can you still see me on that? h prime of x is the outer function, so it's f prime with g prime still intact, so g of x on the inside just safe and warm and hanging out there, no problem, times the derivative of the inner function. So he steps out into the world and we take his derivative. So this is the derivative of the outer with the outer function 
with the inner function intact, not touched, prime the derivative of the inner function. This is the chain rule. Seen a couple and read a couple different reasons why it's called the chain rule. Um, one of them is because that's helpful for students, but I don't think it's entirely historically accurate. It's, it's because you have this and then this, and then if you had and then if you had another function on the inside here, then it would be back here, and then it'd be kind of chained along. That's I don't think the way we normally do it, but that's a good enough way to explain. Some reason has to do with like real chains and gears and, and related rates. Okay, so let's go back to our original problem, and we'll do several examples. Thank you, James. So let's say f of x equals sine of x squared. The derivative is the outer function. James, what's the outer function? All right, what's the derivative of the of Rob? What's first things first? What's the outer function? Uh, the sine. So it's the derivative of the outer function. Cosine. Okay. And we're going to leave the inner function intact. So I'm just going to leave that as x squared. But then I'm going to say times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. Right. Okay. Can you say again what happened? Sure. Yep. That's why we're doing it. So you have to ask yourself, what's the outer function? And what's the inner function? The outer function is sine of blah, okay? The inner function is x squared. So the chain rule says when you have an, uh, when you have an outer function, inner function, the derivative is of all of that together, is the derivative of the outer function. So f prime evaluated, or yeah, f prime with the inside intact. So the derivative of sine is cosine. Okay, so I have cosine, and then the inside is intact, so just so the x squared is just there. But then that is times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of the inside is going to be 2x. Okay. Now, uh, just to be very clear, this 2x is not um, in any way inside the cosine. It literally take the cosine of x squared, then multiply that result by 2x. In fact, what we normally do to uh, uh, eliminate the possibility of confusion with what's inside the cosine, what's not, is we normally take everything that's you know we, that's not inside the parameters of the cosine, take it as a coefficient out front. So we would then only rewrite this just to be very clear: uh, two cosine, or sorry, two x cosine of x squared. Yeah, just stop me if I'm going too fast here. So just to be clear, if we had another one, g of x equals cosine of x cubed. Hard to put you on the spot here. What's the outer function? Now I'm going to put mm -hmm. cosine of the outer function. Now, just remember here, derivative of cosine not just sine, from the derivative of the co-functions is negative. So it's negative sine. And the inside is going to be intact. So x cubed is going to stay as is. But I'm not finished yet, because then I need, the chain rule says, then take the derivative of the inside for this to be complete. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. squared. So to simplify this, we would have negative 3x squared sine of x cubed. That is the derivative of cosine of x cubed. Sorry, cosine, yeah. Cosine of x cubed. All right, questions so far? Right. Uh, we're going to do several more examples. 
just to make sure we're all good before I give you any points on that. Okay, so what if we have y equals the square root of 3x squared minus x plus 1? Tracy, do you see an outer function and an inner function? What's the outer function? I can't because it's square, the square root of well, whatever. Yeah, the outer function is the root. The inner function, the stuff that's on the inside, is 3x squared minus x plus 1. Okay? Now, anytime you see square roots in calculus, just wipe them out and use for the, the, the exponent of the one half power. So we're going to do that anyway. So I'll say parentheses. 3x squared minus x plus 1 to 1 half power. Now it's actually even more clear what the outer function is, what the inner function is. So to take the derivative, and I'm going to use some different notation just because we're. Real quick, I was just to clarify. You don't have, if we were to get, if we were to look at it like that, you couldn't multiply in the 1 half and then find the derivative. No. Say again. Well, like you can't in this situation. You can't like distribute the one half into that function. That's that not is correct. Thing. Right, because the distributing the one half would be the equivalent to saying that this right here is equal to the square root of three x squared minus the square root of x okay. plus yeah, square root of one, and um, and it is not. Okay. So. Yeah, distributes when you got the, when you when you have a multiplier up front, but exponents do not distribute. Okay. But I, I mean, if I was a really good math teacher, I'd say, pause, let's explore and see if that's an actual option. Can you, can you uh, apply, I'm serious though, I mean, really, because you'd be like, you're like, I'm not sure if it's, I mean, the reason, I mean, when I have questions like that, I'm like, I wonder if that's the case. I just throw numbers in there and see if it works. Mm -hmm. And if it works for, you know, several times, then I might even try it out and break with and see if it applies. Um, and that is a little bit of a problem that you're relying on my authority saying, no, you cannot distribute. Well, I, I, I understand the thing when you throw them all out. Yeah. That, really, that does make sense. You know, that work. Right. But even then, I mean, how do you know that it doesn't? I mean, you have to almost throw numbers in there to see what they would, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> um, anyway, all right. But on to finding the derivative, I'm going to write this dy over dx so we kind of get used to alternate notation here. So the outer function is sort of law to the one half. So. We're gonna, uh, when we take the derivative, we're gonna do our power rule, okay? So we're gonna treat this whole thing like a, like a block. So we're gonna say one half times, keep the inside intact, three x squared minus x plus one, power down, so negative one half. But we're not done yet. Chain rule says multiply it times the derivative of the inside. I'm gonna put a bracket for this. So derivative of the inside is six x minus one. And we could leave it like that. We could, if we wanted to be fancy, I guess we could uh, realize that we have a one half, so I'll put that in the denominator. Six x minus one is in the numerator. And Negative one half, we can put it in the, in the denominator and, one, and then it would be positive one half, but that's square root. So I really should do square root 3x squared minus x plus 1. There's a nice rational. So you've got a square root in the denominator, you could just kind of edge it on that, but what would you? Where did I get the what now? The square root? I mean, not square root, it's the. There's a one half out front. So it's one half times all that. If we, I could write it as one over two times okay. all of that. Okay. What if we have h of x equals the sine of two x? James, outer function. Um, it'll be cosine of 2x. And then don't forget the chain rule. It'll be times uh, 2. Yep, times 2. So you would normally simplify it as cos uh, 2 cosine. Um, 
this might be a good time before I go to the next problem to have a little diversion on trig functions and parentheses. Or as I like to call this, trig parentheses. Trig parentheses. So, cosine three x squared, cosine three x squared, Cosine of 3x squared. Cosine squared 3x. <laughs> Those are all different things. And they all mean different things. So let's make sure we see what is what. If in a textbook or in homework problems we see cosine three x squared and there's nothing in it, this is poorly labeled. I don't like this. It's unclear. It's ambiguous. Is it cosine three? Is it cosine three x or uh, squared? That is. Well, you can assume, and this is sort of, I mean, what this means is cosine of three x squared. That's that's what that is. Now I think you can figure out this one, cosine three and then times x squared, that seems pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. You take the cosine of three, enter, and then whatever number that happens to be, you're just saying that's gonna be times x squared. <coughs> All right, what about this? Cosine of three x quantity squared. Well, what that means is, is that we're taking the cosine of three x times three x. Okay, it means that we're doing the exponent here, and then we're taking the cosine of all of that. So this actually would equal the cosine of 9x squared, <coughs> uh, following your order of operations, where, um, you know, you're square. Now what about this one down here? Cosine squared of 3x, what does that mean? Cosine 3x times cosine squared. That is correct. It means cosine 3x, times cosine three x. Or, if you wanted to, you, you could write it as, it's the cosine of three x squared. But that's an extra parentheses that math people just do not want to write. We just want to put the two right here. All right, back off, we're lazy. All right, so with that in mind, Let's say we have y equals tangent squared x, and we want to find the derivative. Well, well, the good, the, the smart thing to do, I would think, would be to rewrite this in a little bit more clear manner. Rewrite it just like this one down here. So we write it as y equals tangent of x because then you'll be able to see clearly this is a chain rule situation this is a function inside a function Gracie what is the outer function in this case something squared yeah something squared right so what's the inner function tangent so uh, I'll put y prime sometimes we do that instead of dy or dx so uh, Chain rule says the derivative of the outside, so that's going to be 2. Okay, next, so uh, with the inside intact, I'll put a 1 right here. So it's sort of ridiculous. You pop down, power down with a function on the inside. Pop down the 2, power down, so now it becomes a 1. Then times the derivative of the inside. I'll put open bracket. Anybody remember tangent, derivative of tangent is? Secant squared. So secant squared x. I'll put that in brackets because nobody likes to put brackets. So this is 2 tangent x secant squared x. So 
And that's the way that you would see it written. Everybody knows that it's just the pains in the back, so they know what they're doing. All right, good stuff. Uh, let's just do a couple more problems. All right, here we go. I'm going to let you all do this yourselves while I get the pen. Negative 7 over 2x minus 3 squared. See what you can do on those at this table.
Anytime I've got, uh, I, I really try to avoid quotient and possible quotient rule situations whenever I can, or, uh, I mean, we'll certainly think about that. We'll see if we get the same answer. Uh, so this is what I recommend. If you've got something in the denominator, put it up here in the numerator with the negative exponent, okay? <laughs> and so that's still the view of that. Here we go, constable, negative seven stays the same. Top down power add, so I've got negative two. And then we've got 2x minus 3, that stays intact, which becomes a power down to negative 3, and then times 2 right there. So then we have, ooh, wow, this is interesting. You end up with a positive? Two problem. I ended up with a positive. I already knew that. And I did it as in, like, I did like low d high minus high d low. Did we do, did we, so we have negative 28 over 2x, I think it's just, here we have negative times negative, and so that's going to be 28 over 2x minus 3 cubed. So we have, that was the original problem. Yeah, so yeah, you forgot the rest of negative. The very beginning, it should have yeah. been negative 7 on the left word. On the white word, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that was negative, negative, we had the positive, positive, positive. So it, it is a positive 28 over you get the same answer. So you do quotient rule? Yeah. That's crazy. It was so hard. Three different ways. Same answer. Yeah, three different ways to do that. That's fine. Uh, just kind of depends on which way you see. So the answer is there's no official way you should get done. Low D high minus high D low, the low squared we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll have the homework for you tomorrow. <laughs> 